my name's Alex um, and I am the technical manager for Norfolk and I'm here with John. And I'm John Cousins, uh, I'm a weed science consultant working for ADAS based at Boxworth. With brome there are several d d different species out there, what are we seeing in the fields at the moment in terms of, in terms of which brome? What we're seeing actually is the mix or the, or the relative abundance of different brome species is, has really been shifting over time. So now um, the soft brome, meadow brome, rye brome group, these lovely soft bromes um, without the enormous awns. Um, more and more we're seeing rye brome as a key problem and less and less perhaps meadow brome and soft brome. And then in the other family, encompassing uh, great brome and sterile brome, actually a massive shift towards great brome uh, and perhaps away from sterile brome. So the nature of thinking about brome as a singular problem is disguising the fact that the very nature of the problem is, is slowly shifting over time and, and we haven't really reacted to that enough, I don't think. That's got hair on the, this stem below the flag leaf. This is sterile brome and it's hairless. There is a diagnostic that we tend to use about the seed length, but what happens is sterile brome plants growing in good conditions have big seed heads and great brome growing in bad conditions have small seed heads. So actually the, the real diagnostic is this difference here between the hairy stems and the hairless stems. There's only a, this little window right now where you've got the flower heads and you can, they've not dried out and you can actually see the stems. Seed size is being a bit confusing. A lot of great brome is actually misidentified as sterile brome. And I think probably the reason the survey says there's loads more great brome around than we used to think is actually because we identified it's it. Some misdiagnosis, yeah. yeah. Um, there's been one or two um, control options surrounding uh, germination and cultivation um, that have been adopted um, f f for brome. Do you think the, these are still, still the case for it or? Uh, I, I think as brome becomes more and more as a significant weed, we're going to have to reevaluate some of these um, long held beliefs and understandings. And, and for me, the absolutely great thing about brome as a group of species is we understand so very little about them, and all the things that we think we understand are completely wrong. So, on a species level, the species mix is different to, I think, what we've come to understand. The germination patterns, the fact that we've got this family of bromes with winter and spring germination uh, and the post-harvest management so we had got quite a, a settled and shared understanding that you manage sterile and grape brome by cultivating as soon as you can after harvest yeah. uh, and that's driven by an observation that some of those populations the germination is considerably reduced in the light so we cultivate as soon as we can after harvest very similar the seeds, yeah. just shallow, encouraged germination, and that the, a diametrically opposed strategy was the relevant one for rye brome and meadow brome, where we leave them on the soil surface after harvest, and that was driven by an observation, again, that some of these populations, the germination is inhibited in the dark, so we leave them in the light and encourage germination. Yeah. But actually, some recent work that, that we've done uh, as part of a, a broader survey of brome, the species and the resistance, and a re-evaluation of that initial work that led to that understanding. I think we're really beginning to question that. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we see is that whilst there are populations, individual populations of rye brome, meadow brome, and sterile brome and grape brome that behave like that, that have that response to light and dark, the vast majority of populations, frankly, don't. Mm -hmm don't respond in that way. So I think our um, development of thinking has to be actually the way to manage all weeds, including black grass and ryegrass and now all bromes, is to think about the way that the environment is impacting on the success of cultivations. Yeah. So if it's really dry, post-harvest, leave weed seeds on the surface, You'll, they'll suffer mortality, you'll increase predation rates, natural predation rates and so on. Mm -hmm. However, once you've got some moisture in the seabed on the soil surface, your optimum approach is to do a very superficial cultivation to increase seed to soil contact, encourage germination, and then obviously you'll 
kill those individuals before drilling. And I think where we probably need to be is a lot more focus on reacting to the environmental conditions post-harvest mm. and perhaps holding on to some of those existing beliefs. Um, because, the var as I said, for Brome, the vast majority of populations won't respond to those management approaches. Yeah. You're better off tailoring the approach to the environment. This uh, shift in, in, in brome varieties, what are we looking at with uh, control um, options? Uh, so let's put them into two families, which is probably just practically the best way of doing it. So we've got this great brome and sterile brome group, They're winter annuals. So targeting them around pre-emergence with thinking about what's in your residual chemistry that's got activity on brome is really important. Um, the other family, the um, soft brome, meadow brome, rye brome, these really are a group of species that will germinate 50-50 in the winter and the spring. So more significant seed return in spring crop parts of the rotation. In terms of targeting herbicides, you're going to have to have some activity on brome both in the spring uh, and in the winter. Uh, and that makes them, as a group, and we probably particularly highlight the rye brome, a really difficult target to manage in crop. Um, so we do want to see a little bit outside of crop um, thinking as well.